Well, hope you guys are all doing well. It's been uh, two weeks since our last um, chat. You know, April says we've already got questions rolling in. So let's do one question and then there was a couple things I wanted to, um, wanted to cover here first. So what's the question, April? <laughs> so, um, the first question is, my balance wheel will not turn backwards to wind the bobbins. Not turn backwards. Will not, the balance wheel will, the question is, the balance wheel will not turn backwards to wind a, a bobbin. Are we referring to the, um, the hand wheel I think is the part we're referring to, but, um, backwards. Uh, yeah, so um, this piece here is, is the hand wheel or the balance wheel. That chrome knob on the end is what you loosen so that the, um, so that the hand wheel will spin without the rest of the machine going um, to, to wind a bobbin. And we do have a tutorial, um, quite a few. So if that's not what you're referring to, maybe she can't get the knob loose. Um, yeah, and we have a new tutorial on, on that as okay, well good. as on getting, getting the, uh, the knob loose. So uh, reply back to April and... Um, well, I gave her the link to the tutorial. Okay, so if that tutorial doesn't help, um, we'll, uh, we'll address it some more. So a um, couple things um, I wanted to mention. Uh, first off being the thread jam tool. Um, those sold out really quick really quickly, um, especially with all the mask sewing and all the machines um, getting jammed up just from a lot of use and such. Um, we manufacture these here at, at the shop, in our machine shop, and um, so we're getting ready to put another batch um, in stock. They've been out of stock since um, uh, just, I think they, they lasted about a day when we put the first batch in. And so we've manufactured some more. We're getting ready to put them in. Um, but until, until we get the manufacturing sped up, mm -hmm. um, they're just going to keep selling out. And, and so um, eventually, if you're looking for one of these, eventually, hopefully, we'll have the supply uh, a little larger to where we quit running out. But it is what it is. But before April puts those in stock... It'll be after the video. Yeah, it'll be after the video um, and when the video ends. I, I first want to address a couple things um, that we've had questions on, and that is the uh, use of it on a 222 or like a 301. So <clears throat> let me get this, get this 222 here. Let me get it in the camera. And let's see. So yeah, Landon, let's switch to this side view right there. Perfect. So this is a 222. Of course, it's been repainted. But the, uh, the, the issue with a 222 in the past, whenever you got a thread jam, <clears throat> and in case anybody's questioning, Krishna, I've got a frog in my throat. Okay. So the <clears throat> 222, normally when you would get a thread jam, you first always have to take the needle plate off. Is the screw still in this one? Yeah, yeah, it is. But the, when you would open up the gib hook to remove the bobbin case base to see that thread jam, the 222 has this much smaller space than the 221, and you can't actually open the gib hook all the way without taking the feed dogs off do you on just, the top. Do you just want to pull that real quick? Uh, you should have a, a, the small screwdriver. Okay. No. Um, you don't? Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Oh. Can you individually? Yes, please. Okay. Small screwdriver? Small screwdriver, yep. So the and the so first let's talk about a, a thread jam. The classic sign of a thread jam is when the hand wheel will not turn at all. So uh, let's go back to the uh, main shot here, Landon. Um, when this hand wheel will not turn at all, that's a classic sign of a thread jam. And when you take the needle plate off, then the hand wheel turns freely. And the reason is Let's go back to a let's go back to a close up. Christian, can you see if you can put that positioning finger in there? That little positioning finger goes in that slot on the end of the uh, on the end of the needle plate like that. And when you get a thread jam inside here, it locks it up so that uh, 
that they won't turn. See, the outside, which is the bobbin case uh, hook assembly, uh, spins independently of the inside, which is the bobbin case base. And so when it gets locked up with a thread jam, this whole thing is stuck. And if you force it, you're going to snap that little finger off right there. So now Christian's going to show you what happens when you try to, or when you, here, I can hold it up for you if you want to take that screw out. So in the past, and again, this is, I'm telling you why this thread jam tool is so helpful, because in the past, you, you would have to take the screw out, and then open up the, the gib hook. Okay, so he's got the screw out, but swing that, swing the gib hook open. Now, because of the 222 has that little, that little uh, uh, small free arm there, there's no room to swing the gib hook open far enough that it takes to get this centerpiece out, the bobbin case base, so that you can get to that thread jam. So previously, on a 222, when you got that thread jam, you had to also get in here and remove the feed dogs and then swing that, swing that uh, gib hook would swing out and up out through the opening in the top of, of your machine. Uh, a huge hassle, and especially if you were like at a quilting retreat or something and you got a thread jam in your 222. So the amazing thing about um, the way the thread jam tool works is the only thing you have to do is take off the needle plate and then the thread jam tool goes on here like such. Yeah, you don't. You would you do don't, this with the screw. Yeah, still in the and gym hook. Then you're able to get the thread jam out like that. So this tool works wonderful for a two 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 um, because it's even harder to get a, a thread jam out. Uh, it also works because the um, okay. It also works. Let's go back to our overhead, or I mean our our main shot. It also works uh, on a three hundred one because the 301 uh, has the same hook assembly. And so the tool here works uh, the same on that as well. Now, the one thing I wanted to tell you, just uh, so that at, when the video's done and April puts these back in stock, there are two, um, two of these tools. Let's see if I can get them both here on the camera so you can kind of see the difference. And these two tools, um, there we go. Uh, yeah, these two tools, Let's go on this this side shot here. Okay. Well, I'm trying to keep it in focus here. Okay. See how there's different um, little tabs, and those tabs go in the holes here on the end of the hook assembly. And so the majority of all featherweights are going to have this one right here, and that's the main one. But if you have a 1933 and some 1934s, it has a slightly different hook assembly and it has to use this one with these little pins. So we have a few of these in, that we'll put back in stock as well, but the majority of you are gonna need uh, this main one that is listed, I, I think it's listed as uh, is it like 1935 on or something like that on that listing. So anyway, just so that you order the right one, uh, most of you are gonna want this one, this one right here. Um, only a few featherweights would take the other one, so. Okay. Um, why don't some attachments have some ankle stamped on them and others are stamped singer? Did one precede the other and what more do you know about that? Okay, this is Christian's department right here. So the question is, why do some of the attachments, some singer attachments say singer, some say singer USA, and some say um, Samanco? Samanco stands for Singer Manufacturing Company. It's a sort of abbreviation. and most of the attachments that were produced here in the US are gonna say Singer USA or Singer on them, uh, but they sometimes do say Samanco, but the majority of them are gonna say Singer and Singer USA. If they're produced in the UK, most of them are gonna say just Samanco and then the part number. You can tell the difference between, uh, say, an adjustable hammer that was produced um, here in the US versus in the UK because the UK ones uh, generally just say Samanco and the ones here in the U.S. say Singer USA. 
And then there's other ones like sometimes you'll find presser feet that'll say um, singer C A N for Canada, and um, and then sometimes you'll say you'll see singer Great Britain as well. But generally, it the Samanco means the same thing. It was a abbreviation for Singer Manufacturing Company. So they all are original Singer feet, but generally just produced in different factories. Is it okay to switch from forward to reverse while you are running the machine? I do it, it doesn't seem to hurt anything, but wonder if I have unseen damage. Ah, good, good question. Is it okay to switch from forward to reverse while the machine is running? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Sure, then we're um, not Yeah, numbers. so uh, that's just raising the uh, stitch length lever all the way up throws your machine into reverse. So you're definitely going to want to do that as you're starting on a seam and you're going to lock in your seam. Uh, you start and then throw it into reverse, go back and forth. Um, yeah, not a problem. Really all it's doing is it's not like, it wouldn't be the same as throwing your car in reverse while you're going forward because really all it's doing is moving uh, what's happening with the feed dogs. And the feed dogs are feeding the fabric and so it just, it changes uh, a little cam in there. So. Yeah, not hurting anything at all. The hook assembly is still spinning the same direction to mm -hmm. make that stitch, but the feed dogs are going the opposite direction. Excellent. Yes. Good question. Um, my question today is the use of ultrasonic cleaners to clean bobbin cases and attachments. Pros, cons, your thoughts on this? Pros and cons on using the ultrasonic cleaner to, to clean uh, bobbin cases, attachments, um, screws, anything else. Uh, we use Actually, in the back there, we have multiple ultrasonic cleaners, and they are running um, most of the day. Uh, they do an excellent job of um, basically an ultrasonic cleaner is like a jewelry cleaner. You can find them on Amazon for uh, in the mid-20s, um, so they're pretty, pretty inexpensive. Mm -hmm. uh, the amazing thing, I don't know how, if this one's probably been cleaned or not, but the faceplate, uh, especially on a, on a featherweight, often has that brownish look from old oil on there and that in an ultrasonic cleaner with a little uh, dish soap or jewelry cleaner um, and that high frequency bubbles basically what it does is it, it's scrubbing it without harming it at all um, years ago decades ago when when i when i started so it's been 15 plus years um, i would often get uh, you know metal polish and things like that to try to clean those uh, but when you do, it still leaves a little bit of a haze because any polish has some form of, it has to have some kind of an abrasive in it. And that's the thing, the ultrasonic cleaner has no abrasive. Now the danger with the ultrasonic cleaner, if there is a danger, is the, the fact that you're putting it in water. And so if you left it in there long term, yeah, um, which I've been guilty of that, come back after a weekend, whoops, I left those screws in there and they've started to rust. Um, so the danger is that you are dealing with water, uh, but usually we run the cycle and immediately when we run the cycle, we shake, shake them out. Uh, most ultrasonic cleaners have a little basket that uh, you pull the basket out, shake out the excess water, and then wipe them down with kerosene or, um, or sewing machine oil, and then you're fine. So not really much um, uh, negative to the ultrasonic cleaner. Now the ultrasonic cleaner, it's mainly meant for grime. So it's not going to do anything if you've got pitted corrosion and all that on there. Then you're going to have to start with something like Evaporust or one of those products, Naval Jelly or something, to get, to get that off there. And you don't want to put black oxide finished parts in the ultrasonic cleaner. Black screws or... Um, or the painted parts. Or the painted parts. Right. Yeah. It's just parts that are chrome. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so we put, uh, you know, it's fine to put a ruffler or something like that in there. You just have to wipe it all down and put a little oil or uh, some kerosene or something on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good question. Is it possible to over oil my featherweight and if so what will happen to my machine? C the question is, is it possible to over oil my featherweight? What do you think? <laughs> it is possible. The featherweight just takes one drop of oil at every oiling point and just a little bit of grease at the places that it gets the so retro grease. So if you do over the over oil the machine by putting multiple drops of oil where it should just take one, it's not going to necessarily hurt the machine. It's just going to make a little bit of a mess and it's going to be more difficult to clean next time. So 
when you get a new machine in, one that um, you haven't had in before and you want to clean it up, it's likely going to have a lot of uh, varnish in there from being over oiled. So once you clean that off, if you just maintain the one drop of oil at every location, then you shouldn't have to do a deep clean like you did initially again. And when Christian's saying one drop of oil, um, he means one drop of oil. We carry both um, little brass spout oilers and zoom spout. And I like both of them because you can squeeze out and get it to drip off one drop of oil. Um, one drop of oil does not actually mean a squirt here and a squirt there. It's um, not one squeeze. Yeah. yeah, it's not one squeeze. It's literally one drop. Right. And it's always neat. Uh, we experienced that because April's done a lot of mass sewing and everything lately. Uh, you, we experienced in our own house just the other night how a drop of oil can completely change the sound of a machine, especially mm -hmm. in your hook assembly. Yeah. Okay, Kristen, this is probably a good question for you so that you can explain how a switch is made when it's other way with the um, horizontal or vertical hook. Mm -hmm. um, how do you straighten the stitch? Okay. Uh, the question is, how do you straighten the stitch? The featherweight, when it makes a stitch, is um, slanted just a little bit. Each stitch is in a, it's in a straight line, but each stitch is not necessarily straight um, perpendicular to the fabric, or it's usually just canted just a little bit. Um, that is totally normal, and the way that the featherweight um, stitch should look, because the hook assembly is on the end of the machine. If the hook assembly was on the front of the machine or on the top of the machine, that um, the loop and where that stitch is locking is going to be directly, um, is it in front or behind the needle? But it's going to be directly in line with the needle mm -hmm. this way instead of off to the side like the hook assembly is over here. So when it makes that stitch, it's on this side of the needle, and that's why the stitches on the featherweight and other machines where the hook assembly is on the end like this, they aren't going to be exactly straight. They are slanted just a little bit, even though they're in a straight line. Yeah, so like your uh, 401 or whatever, for example, is going to have a top load uh, bobbin uh, here, same like with your 201. Um, but a lot of your Berninas, um, like my mom's uh, 830, uh, or no, I guess she has a 730, uh, is, uh, is, fr is front load. And um, so that also completely has everything to do with um, why the flat side of the needle mm -hmm. is to the left on right. a featherweight. It's because th to the left is actually where the hook assembly is. So um, it, it would be, that's why it's different if you've got a top loading. Uh, the needle, the flat side's not going to be uh, to the left. It has to do with where the needle is meeting, meeting the hook, right. and it has to be relevant to, to that. So that's a good question. Okay, and similar question is, what would cause the fabric to pucker as you sew? Stitches are great, but feel really tight. Okay. Yeah. What would cause the uh, fabric to pucker mm -hmm. uh, as you're sewing? Yeah. Several things, but yeah, go ahead. So, uh, I mean, you've got... Uh, which actually I just did a video um, that uh, is being edited now uh, having to do with uh, pressure, uh, uh, needle, uh, not needle bar, uh, presser foot pressure. Uh, too much pressure can cause the fabric to not want to feed properly. Um, if your feed dogs aren't coming up high enough or if they're coming up too high or whatever. But usually, usually what we're talking about is tension too tight. And so the tension's tight and it's not letting the fabric want to feed. Um, because the tension from your upper uh, and your lower is keeping the fabric from wanting to advance. Mm -hmm. And um, that's going to be the typical and the easiest way to see if that's the issue. If that's the, um, if you got a fabric that's puckering, just loosen up your, your top tension quite a bit. And uh, if, that, if that remedies it, um, then you know that you, you don't have to start messing with feed dogs and, and all that. And if it is, if you've, if you've got your tension set, um, because a couple things uh, regarding tension, um, but if you have your tension set and you've used a bobbin tension meter, um, whether a commercial one or, or the simple one that we sell, um, uh, 
that's the easiest and the first thing that you should do and then move on to the other reasons um, why fabric would be puckering like that. So speaking of bobbin tension meter, um, <clears throat> I've been talking to Burl a lot, Burl who's our, our shop manager, about the questions that he's getting um, because so many of you are um, stuck at home and so you're sewing whether masks or you're just sewing. And um, so what I've, I asked him this morning what kind of questions are coming in uh, and he said one of the questions that's coming in a lot is that after people have gotten a thread jam, they can't get their machine sewing quite right again. And quite often it is that um, basically something has happened in the process of a thread jam and trying to get it out where they need to go back to the beginning and set the tension. Uh, if you don't have a tension meter, um, this is what they are. Christian can probably... Uh, I'm thinking the best way to, uh, you might just, uh, might just stick on the screen that we've got. Christian, you want to pull that bobbin case right there? There's this one right here. Or Is that, that one? You want to? Yeah. I don't know where that one came from. I think I used it last time. It's kind of a corroded one, but um, yeah. So the bobbin tension meter works uh, really simple. We're shooting for about 23 grams of, of tension on uh, the thread that is coming off the bobbin case. Up here, you've got a number to adjust, assuming that you're calibrated and everything. Um, and, and But you start with the most um, minute, I guess mm -hmm. you would say, um, uh, adjustment happens on the bobbin case. So the first thing you wanna do is to adjust the bobbin case with the bobbin tension meter, um, or a commercial one if you happen to have one, mm -hmm. and go for that 23 grams of tension. And then once you know the bottom's right, then all your adjustments are gonna be made on the top. Uh, if you're if you're loopy, then you're going to tighten it up, and and if it's if it's too tight, you, and you need to you need to loosen it. So anyway, Christian will show you how to how to work this thing here. It's pretty. We can put on this camera. Yeah. Okay, which which camera do you want to go? That one. Uh, yeah, yeah. There we go. There we go. Okay, so he's got the bobbin tension meter, and you can see here on the side of it that it's got a, a numbered scale. So this is basically a simple postage uh, scale. That's all this is, um, but it's a few hundred dollars cheaper than buying an actual bobbin tension uh, meter, and um, it does the same exact thing. We're shooting for 23 grams of tension. So Christian's going to lift up on the bobbin tension meter, and he's going to keep the, keep the uh, uh, bobbin case there. And you can see on this one, when he pulls up, the bobbin itself is just starting to spin and he's all the way up there at like 50 grams of tension or whatever. So he needs to loosen the tension on, uh, on the bobbin case. There's two screws on the side there. Uh, the one screw that is closest to where the thread comes out underneath the spring. So the thread's coming out there, that one that's right there. He's going to loosen that, and to adjust your bobbin case, um, you do little, little tiny adjustments. Like he's probably going to start with a quarter of a turn, probably at the most, uh, at that much uh, difference. Uh, Being that he's he's all the way up over forty, he's got a he's got a ways to go. But sometimes you're making little, little bitty adjustments, um, just barely turning that screwdriver at all. Okay. Make sure you're not touching the bobbin at all. Yes, yeah, so you want to make sure that your fingers aren't touching the bobbin. And right when that bobbin spins counterclockwise, you want to be looking for what the what the tension is indicator is showing on the uh, the bobbin case. Now, if if it wants to jump around greatly, there's a couple things that can cause that. Um, one of the things that cause that is inferior bobbins, uh, if they're not completely round. The other thing is really cheap thread. This uh, is really cheap That's thread. cheap thread? <laughs> okay. So uh, when the thread fibers are put together, um, and we can go back on the main, there we go. When the thread fibers are put together, um, it's fine thread is made with lots of long fibers uh, spun together. Uh, cheap thread, they're using all the little fibers, and if you actually look at cheap thread, um, dollar store type thread, if you look at that, if you take a piece of black thread and you lay it out on a white piece of paper and you look at it with a magnifying glass, you can actually see the wave 
of that thread as those fibers are spun together. And basically what it's doing is as that's passing underneath the spring on your bobbin case, you're getting uh, varying tension every time it's passing over one of these uh, uh, lumps, I guess you would call it, in, in the thread. Um, and so it's, it's hard to dial in your tension exactly right because uh, it's jumping around so much. That's going to come, uh, that's going to uh, show up in what your stitch looks like once it actually gets into the fabric because your tension's jumping all around. Uh, if, you, if your tension jumps around on the bobbin tension meter, then it's going to jump around as it's going into your fabric as well. That's why we prefer um, your, your higher end um, threads like Aurifil. Okay, the, so the question was, um, can we talk about the pressure foot pressure, uh, how to adjust that and everything. That is the video that I just finished um, and is being edited. Uh, it'll actually be out in um, not, not this Tuesday, uh, but the following, following Tuesday. The big knob up here, pressure foot pressure knob, that's the knob up there. That adjusts your amount of pressure and basically you increase pressure. Um, to put more pressure down on the foot, uh, which can help with like skip stitches going over a seam, uh, you loosen the pressure if um, if you were sewing, you know, on silk or something that you didn't want all that pressure uh, digging into uh, the teeth digging into your fabric. So, stay tuned for that one. Becky Carolus, when doing normal piecing, what is the best position to start the presser foot tension control knob? So that's probably a similar question. Mm -hmm. Like how, how, how much pressure should it have? Right. And this knob is a, it's not a very precise adjustment. Mm. If you want to see a big change in how the fabric's feeding, it's going to take a couple turns. Just turning it a little bit isn't going to make a noticeable difference in most every case. So generally, if the spring hasn't been compressed over many years of the presser foot being up, then it's going to be about three thread lengths showing on the screw. If the screw's pushed in all the way, mm -hmm. if it's been like that for a long time, the spring is likely going to be too compressed and you'll want to pull that spring out and stretch it. Oh, let's see, we're too, too high up to show that on that other but the um, when he says threads he's not talking threads like this he's talking these little threads on the side of the screw so when you can see about three little threads on the side of the screw that's that's the typical spot to have that's that. how it should be it sh it's not a screw that should be all the way in it is an adjustment screw so the farther out it is the less pressure is going to be on the foot and the farther in if it's screwed in all the way, that's the most pressure you can get without pulling the spring out and stretching it. Yeah, yep. Okay, um, Ray, Renee Mayfield, how do you set the stitch length on a featherweight to a particular length number? There is no real indicator to set on the number you want. Okay, so that's a good qu question by Renee, is, is how do you set your stitch length uh, number to be accurate or whatever on a featherweight. Uh, the truth is, yeah, those numbers are uh, a guide. Um, they're not um, a, any sort of a precision thing. So if you really, I mean, if you're looking for 10, 10 stitches per inch, uh, which is what those numbers should mean. You know, if you drop it all the way down here, this featherweight shows that the bottom number is six, so that you should have six stitches in an inch, uh, like a basting stitch. The truth is a featherweight doesn't have a long enough uh, feed dogs and a throw of those feed dogs to truly get a really good uh, basting stitch and a, a 222 is even worse. Um, so really if you're, if you're wanting exact accuracy, you're going to do something like uh, get it to where you like it by counting those stitches and then putting, uh, putting your, your lever you know, at that point, screwing the the little adjustment, um, the stop in here, and the stop is so that every time you put it down, it's going to go back to that same spot. You can still throw it up into reverse all the way, but you're going to come back down to the same spot. Unfortunately, it's not like a digital machine where you could just type in a number and, and have it go back to that. Um, 
a little bit of guesswork with a featherweight. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. My problem is with the thread coming off the cone of thread. I use a cone of Guterman thread and have a stand. Depending on where I place the stand, I find my thread twisting and then it tries to go into the tension on the machine. How do I get that to stop happening? What she's not indicating is if she has a featherweight thread stand or a tabletop one. And it could be a thread. Yeah, uh, so the, the question is uh, with a Guterman cone, uh, it's not coming off smoothly, it's doing some twisting. Um, I've not used Guterman cones uh, to know exactly how tight they are, uh, the threads are twisted. Uh, threads are twisted uh, at the factory uh, based on, on that particular factory, and so they're going to have a certain amount of tension and twist to them. Um, one of the reasons um, like that we have the little knob, uh, or not knob, this little tab here on this upper thread guide when using a thread post is because it's natural for that thread to get a little twist. It usually works itself out long before it gets down to the tension unit. Um, but even if you notice on your, your Bernina or whatever, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to occasionally get that twist, but the twist usually pulls out and um, it, it usually doesn't cause any issues. So if you've got one where that twist is extreme, um, I would probably say snap a couple photos or even a short video, send it to the tech department and we'll troubleshoot with you, with you that way. Because there's, there's issues as far as uh, whether you're using a tabletop stand or whether you're using the thread stand that goes uh, actually on the featherweight. Um, but typically, I mean, April uses, uh, either the, uh, mainly I think the Presencia cones, and she uses cones quite often, um, you know, so uh, shouldn't be any reason that it couldn't be figured out, but... Uh, but I do use a featherweight thread stand. Yeah, you do use the featherweight thread stand, so, um, yeah, pictures or a video might, might help us process that one a little bit. Okay, um, I've noticed my tension get mad when I switch from sewing fabric to sewing elastic ends together. Your tension gets mad. <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> okay, so Sarah says, my tension gets mad whenever I'm throwing, uh, sewing um, uh, elastic. elastic and going back to um, that. I wonder what she means by gets mad. It's just, it's off. Probably uh, just gets, you know, snarled or something. Yeah, it, it's, it's a good question. I mean, it shouldn't be. I mean, if you, if you were going directly from one to the other, maybe. But if you, if you stopped and snipped your thread and, and started over, uh, there shouldn't, be, shouldn't really be any reason for that. Um, will we see Sarah at Missouri Star this year? I don't know. Maybe it's the way she's holding her mouth. <laughs> April says it's the way you're holding your mouth, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> If you come to Missouri Star this year, we'll, uh, we'll take a look and uh, do some elastic sewing and see. Okay, I'm having trouble getting my tension balanced. The bottom thread shows on the top, no matter how I set the upper tension, what am I doing wrong? Okay, the question is uh, just having problems uh, getting the tension uh, right, uh, no matter how we set the upper tension. Um, uh, so one of the so there's a couple things that this could be. Uh, the first thing is, like I mentioned, you got to start with adjusting your your bobbin tension. Uh, I know Grandma said don't ever touch the tension on that, but the truth is it has to be, the tension has to be right on your bobbin case. There has to be a starting point, uh, a baseline, if you will. And so um, that would be my first thing is to say, okay, um, make sure that you're at that 23-ish uh, grams of tension on your bobbin case and that it's flowing off there smoothly. Uh, if it's not, uh, you know, there can be, you know, uh, over time, especially with cheap thread, you can get lint built up underneath the, uh, underneath the spring here on the bobbin case. Mm -hmm. And so um, that, that could be part of, uh, part of the issue. Um, but um, the idea, you know, a lot of people say, oh, all your tension should be, adjustments should be made on the top. That's true once the bobbin case has been set. Once the bobbin case has been set, uh, and it's perfect if you're getting bobbin case uh, uh, thread coming up onto the top of your fabric, then that means you've got the top too tight. It's pulling too tight and it's pulling the top up. Um, if you've got the bobbin case set perfectly and um, you're getting uh, loops and such on the bottom, it means that you need to tighten your top. Um, so we've got tutorials on 
pretty much all the adjustments for, for tension like that. So I would say start there. If it's just something that's beyond um, the norm of, of what's handled in those videos, then yeah, call the tech department. The other issue is if you're trying to use some uh, a large uh, spool of cross-wound thread and you're using it without either a thread post or a thread stand, then that additional uh, uh, tension from the thread, the post, the spool of thread spinning is going to cause you some some tension issues as well. Okay, is storing a machine, especially for collectors with multiples on display, should one release the tension on all springs? Yes. So uh, we talked about this last week, a common question, um, and that is um, how to store your machine long term. Um, because there are three springs that are compressed every time the presser foot is lifted, you want the presser foot in the down position so that the tension is off those springs. Um, but if it's in the down position, your foot is down on the feed dogs and you don't want that because you're going to get wear to your feed dogs or rust on the bottom uh, from the metals there. The same with storing fabric under it. If you store fabric under your foot with the foot down, the fabric collects moisture and that can cause your feed dogs to rust. So we recommend the short answer is presser foot lever down, but store it with the presser foot off. Mm -hmm. And the lever on my 222 to lower the feed dogs is very still. Is this an area that can be oiled? Very, stiff. very stiff uh, lever. Um, that's uh, that's this one right right here. Let's see if we get that in the video. Um, actually, Landon, would you go with that overhead shot? And uh, yeah, so that's this lever. Whoops, that's this lever right here, and um, it's the one that drops the feed dogs. That's one of the beauties of the two 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 is you can drop your feed dogs. Uh, it can be, it can, there is a cam in there that can be oiled. Um, that would probably be, that would probably be the main reason is, is uh, lack of oil. Usually, usually though, let's see if I can get to it up here. You do have to pull out. There, there is a spring here. You do have to pull out before you can move it. Um, but um, it's, I'll turn this here, you can see the, uh, maybe you can't see it, but as I move that, you'll notice that there's two little arms up in there, which a 222 has two versus, versus a 221 that only has the one. So as uh, that, that's moving, so make sure you've done your oiling up in the top uh, of your machine as well, um, because that's another place that could cause that, cause that to be stiff. If that doesn't, uh, if that doesn't answer that question, um, could be something possibly bent in there, um, mm -hmm. but I would call and talk to one of the techs about that. Um, I noticed the spindle that you have on your machine, um, if he's horizontal, do you have those available? Yes, uh, she's referring to the uh, thread post, um, which feeds fabric horizontal, which is how uh, crosswound spools are made to um, have the the thread feeds off the end like that. Um, so you need either one of these or a, a, um, a featherweight thread stand um, to make that work. And I'm sure they'll throw a link out there so that you can see, um, so you can see uh, what that is. But um, yeah, Karen Miller from, who's a, a teacher with Orophil who does like a lot of um, their free motion work. Um, she's actually demoed, demoed that for us and yeah we, we've had it out for oh, not quite a year um, but it's uh, it, it's really helpful because the thread stand you know it goes in this hole here and then hangs up over here and it's hard to get it exactly over the top of the spool of thread and so for a small spool like this the thread post works great if you're going to sew with a cone you know we often set a cone in a cup in a mug behind your machine uh, so it's not rolling around everywhere, and then use the thread stand and feed out of that. Okay, how can you remove, um, well, it's already answered that question for her. Is there a list of the type of thread and needle size to use with each type of fabric that works with the featherweight? Question is, is there a list of 
needle size and thread that works best. Um, on our needle pages, we have that. Okay, so on our needle page, April, could you link that there? Sure. Show that and we'll not, yeah, don't link it, but just show it here and then we can put it up there on the screen. Um, so yeah, a lot of that information is there because it is, especially with uh, fine sewing, to get the best result, you want to use the appropriate uh, size thread with the right size needle, mm -hmm. uh, especially, you know, also depending on the kind of fabric you're using. Um, so, um, you know, if you're, if you're sewing on uh, batiks, you know, with a real tight weave, then you're going to want a, a, a more of a fine needle. Um, so on the Microtex needles? So, uh, yeah, go, to, go ahead and go to that uh, screen share there, Landon. Uh, so this is, uh, this is like happens to be our Microtex needles. And if you go scroll down on that listing, um, there's uh, a lot of information on needle size and, and type and, and uh, appropriate uh, for the work that you're doing. So, yep. I purchased the thread stand that sticks in the hole on the top of the machine. Later mm -hmm. on, you introduced the sidewinder thing that goes on spools. And are there two different uses? Should I use one over the other? Yeah, the question was just uh, back to the, the thread stand. Um, the thread stand's been available for several years. Uh, and of course, tabletop thread stands have been available for a long time. Um, but the is, are there different uses? And yes, the, the thread stand, which is the one that goes uh, in the hole here, um, it is for a, it's, it works best for a cone, if you're gonna set a cone behind the machine. Um, yeah. And Ruthie's tutorial next week, she'll talk about that. Oh, uh, and Ruthie, Ruthie's tutorial coming up on, is that Tuesday? Mm -hmm. Now Ruthie has a fun tutorial coming out on Tuesday um, of next week and um, she talks. She talks about that. So, yeah, stay tuned for that one. How difficult is it to adjust the feed dog side to side? One of my featherweights seems to be slightly rubbing the right slot of the throat plate. Okay. Uh, the question is adjusting the feed dogs um, side to side uh, if it's rubbing on the um, on the throat plate. That's probably. I don't even have the tools out here. Um, Probably something do we because I don't think we have a video of that. I mean, I know you can kind of kind of see some of that in the service manual, but that's probably one um, that that definitely call the the text. Send, send some pictures would help, but the feed dogs themselves do have a little bit of play side to side. So if you need if you see that it's rubbing on the left or the right side, you can pull the needle plate off. The two screws that hold the feed dogs on just loosen those up. A couple turns and you can yeah. see how the feed dogs have a little bit of play side to side. So you can try and make that adjustment based on which side it's rubbing on. If it's rubbing on this left side, push them a little bit to the right. And it's rub if it's rubbing on the right side, push them a little bit to the left. There's not much adjustment, but you can it's try usually that. Enough. It, it's usually enough, but mm -hmm. if it doesn't work, definitely send us some photos and, and or give us a call. And that was one of the pain in the neck of the uh, the 222 getting a thread jam you had to remove the feed dogs and uh, it's not a big adjustment um, but you do have to you, you know you line the feed dogs up and then you think they're right and then you put the needle plate on mm -hmm. and you realize they're adjusting so the problem is uh, once you there's not an adjustment that you can do with the needle plate needle plate securely fastened and so like Christian said you have to take the needle plate off and then you can wiggle those those feed dogs around left or right and um, and then you think it's right and you put the needle plate back on so sometimes it's a it's a process that takes two or three right. shots to get it right i read through the historical timeline and wondering about my december 30th 1935 featherweight mm -hmm. has a numbered tension dial for mm -hmm. this particular machine to be in that transition period of change it does have characteristics of early machines okay so the question is in regards to the timeline, she's got a 1935, December of 1935 machine with that um, numbered tension unit. 
The tension unit is a fairly easy replacement. You can take a non-numbered tension unit from 1933 through 1937, take it off and can drop one there a the numbered screen? tension unit on there very easily. A 33. So yeah. the 1935, I have not seen any 1935 machines with an original uh, numbered so old tension unit on there. The non-numbered tension unit went into 1937, so it is a couple years prior to when the numbered tension unit would first start showing up. Um, the good news is it's likely still an original tension unit and not something that's going to decrease the value of the machine a lot. It actually makes the machine a little bit easier to use. But um, yeah, it's uh, likely not the original tension unit because it is an easy replacement but um, still uh, likely an original Singer featherweight tension unit. Okay, so we have, an, we have a video on um, adjusting the, uh, the tension unit. Uh, can you guys put that up there on the screen? Okay, so how to adjust, how to adjust tension on an early Singer featherweight model. Uh, you'll notice that the tension unit there does not have those numbers around there. Uh, it's just the spring and the adjustment knob out there on the end. So everything is by feel on the early tension units. Uh, so if you were to wanted to loose your, loosen your tension way up so you could do a loose uh, basting stitch, um, you have to go back to manually setting your, your tension once you return to regular sewing. And so um, that's, uh, that's one of the things that uh, that early style, that's why a lot of people switch out that early style. We get a lot of calls here at the shop that say, okay, my tension unit's missing some pieces because it doesn't have the numbers on it. Mm -hmm. It's not missing anything. Uh, it's just from that, from that early style. Unfortunately, they're easy to switch out. Uh, I would keep the original uh, around uh, for the provenance of the machine to keep everything uh, original. If it ever got sold or anything like that, you want to keep it as original as possible. But as far as use, it's not a big deal to, to switch right. them out. Right. And, and if you are switching them out, the whole, I don't know if you mentioned that, Christian, but the whole thing has to be replaced. Right. Uh, the post is different uh, and the thread pitch. So when you screw that screw in, uh, the, the knob here on the end, it's different. So you can't just, can't just take the parts of it and switch it. You, have you to can't switch just the add thing. the numbers. You have to switch out the whole unit. Yeah. Do I need to check bobbin tension with different threads that are the same weight? Do I need to check bobbin Ten, uh, just check check tension with different threads that are the same weight. So, like with the bobbin tension meter, just when does she check? check yeah, it? if you get really used to the bobbin tension meter, you'll see that it takes seconds, and it's not really a big deal. Um, there's typically not any reason if you were switching from one quality thread to another, both in the same weight. There should be very little difference on your bobbin uh, on your bobbin tension. But if you have a bobbin tension meter, it's so fast and easy to check that if you started seeing issues somewhere, that's the first thing I would do is, okay, just check, make sure that nothing's different. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to, um, and you typically wouldn't need to. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't see it. No more questions. No more questions. Okay. Um, one of the other things that Burl told me... Um, that was uh, going on uh, with some of these questions is people were sewing masks and they were uh, putting, you know, if you put a little tiny piece of tin or whatever in there for the nose bridge piece on, on the mask, uh, they were hitting that while sewing and they're sewing fast. I talked to one gal the other day and she'd sewn over 500 masks, so that's pretty cool. Um, but um, actually a couple machines during this time have actually had the needle bar knocked out of time. A featherweight almost never gets out of time by sewing, but if you ran into some, some sure enough metal or whatever and it came to a screeching stop, uh, it, could, it could be knocked out of time. So Christian, do you want to turn that one? I can maybe make an adjustment on that camera so that we can see, um, see that with the needle plate or the throat face plate, excuse me, with the face plate off there. Okay, Christian is taking, I'm not plugged in. 
I'm taking the face plate off this machine here to access the needle bar adjustment. If the needle bar was uh, shifted, if it hit some metal and the needle bar shifted up when you were sewing, you can fix that, but first you have to remove the face plate. The needle bar is held in place. It goes into the housing of the machine. And this is the needle bar here that's moving. Mm -hmm. And it's held in place as far as up and down. It's held by the tension from this screw and clamp right there. So if the needle bar shifted up a little bit, we would loosen this screw. Maybe. A couple <laughs> turns. And then the needle bar can slide. So now if I turn up or down. Yeah. So see, I'm, I'm moving the, the thing. So this machine is going to be completely out of time now um, by, by doing that. And so um, Christian actually uh, can do timing in his sleep, I think. <laughs> And, uh, and so he'll show you here the marks um, because Singer, you know, they've got marks on the needle bar. So, I mean, yes, he just took it out of time, but for him to fix that is super simple. So I think you can probably see there um, the little marks. Yeah, right there. Right there uh, there's right two there. marks. Pull, go ahead and pull it down lower so they can That's see there's... Can okay, you want me to move this up? Yeah. Okay. So you can see there's actually two marks on the end of that, on the end of that. There you go. Okay. So the one mark is for when the uh, needle uh, is in the very lowest position. The next mark is when it comes up just a hair and that puts the machine uh, back in time. And by time, we're talking about when the uh, hook, the point of the hook meets the, uh, basically the eye of the needle. Uh, that's when your machine is out of time and those two things, the top and the bottom, don't come together at the same spot, you're not going to have a machine that'll sew. And so Christian is going to so you can tight. You can see here how the clamp, you can pay it when you're trying to get the needle to its lowest point, you can pay attention to that clamp right there. See when that clamp is all the way down at the bottom. Then you can pull the needle bar down to where that upper line is flush with this bushing right here right with the bottom mm -hmm. yep. and with it flush he'll now tighten it up move that out of your way a little bit Perfect. so now this machine is is back in time Simple as that. That's um, in the service manual. That is in the, uh, service, is in the service manual. manual. One of the things that that uh, Singer did, um, which was which was really nice, is like down there on the hook assembly itself. It's actually onto the flat. Um, the the screws that hold the hook assembly are onto a flat spot on um, the main shaft that runs through there. So you're not going to knock the hook assembly out of time. Um, because it's not going to get past that flat spot. You can knock this out of time and you can also knock one of the gears out of time. It's another place where it's not on a not mm -hmm. on the flat spot. This would be your most common one by something just coming to a screeching halt. You know, you're sewing fast and you hit something hard and uh, it could, if that screw wasn't tight enough, it could cause that to slip. Really rare, but apparently um, rare, but happened a couple times this week. So. Um, so the next question has to do with the attachments again. It says, can I revisit the question about Semenko and Singer stamp attachments? The different parts of the earliest featherweights are all stamped Semenko. Were the parts ma made in the U.S. or in Europe? If the parts are made in the U.S., wouldn't the attachments that are similarly stamped also be made in the U.S.? I'm not following you. Say it. She wanted to revisit. She just wanted to make sure that the just because they're Samanco that they're not just made in the. In no, the no Samanco like um, <laughs> this machine here is a two two one uh, Centennial made in the U.S. Underneath the bed, you can see the part number and stamp there it says Samanco USA. Singer stamped quite a few different things. 
um, if you take a, um, a face plate like this one here, this is an earlier face plate from the uh, uh, US made Singer 221 and it just has the number here 45718. If you took a face plate from a machine made in Great Britain, it would say Samanco and then that number. So it's not always consistent. It, it's not always consistent, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, so um, next question is, how do you make certain that the new belt is tight or loose enough? How do you make certain that the new belt is tight or loose enough? It, um, I'm talking about the super belt. I'm talking about the super belt. Uh, the, the belts are made to be um, fairly loose, but this, the new super belt is much more uh, forgiving on the adjustment compared to the old ones. And so you want it, um, you, you, you can start out with it pretty loose um, and that's by raising and lowering the motor here. That's, a, that's how you adjust that tension on your belt. Um, but if you, if you get to the point to where you have to reach up and help your hand wheel to get started because it's slipping, then it's obviously, um, then, then, it's, uh, then it's too loose. So you just loosen the screw on the motor, push the motor down, and adds a little bit of tension. But it's not meant to be rubber band tight, you know, um, like a, like a, you know, uh, a vacuum belt or, you know, your power steering belt or something like that. It's not meant to have great amount of pressure. It's still uh, pretty loose. Um, Frank Toda has a question. Your bobbin tension meter is black with white letters. Is this what you sell in your shop? Yeah, interesting. Frank, how are you doing, Frank? Um, Frank's question is on the um, bob and tension meter. Uh, this is a uh, black one. Uh, the meter is black with white lines on it. We've had chrome ones before um, where we actually made a line there at 23 grams. Uh, right now, um, I like these because it's really easy to read. The, the chrome ones you had to have in the light just right to see how far out you were even if that line was there at 23. Um, we've made a couple changes over the years just as whatever is available. Mm -hmm. um, I do like that um, both of the last two kinds that we've sold have a flat uh, alligator clip. The earliest ones that were also black, uh, the alligator clip had teeth and so you had to kind of wad the, uh, the thread up to get it to stay in there so that you could pull out and adjust your tension. But yes, these are the black ones are what we have uh, in the shop now and will have for the foreseeable future. Okay. Um, Patty Castile says hi. Okay, I was making masks and put on the quarter inch foot I purchased ages ago. Um, mm -hmm. it, was, it didn't fit, it was too long in the shank, finished up with the foot I had. Yeah, I don't know if that was a question. Maybe she had a slant shank foot. Yeah, the question was the shank seemed too long on a quarter inch foot. Uh, most likely it's it's a slant shank foot. Slant shank foot would be for like your 301 um, and um, the, the foot, both the needle bar and the presser bar sit at an angle. Singer thought it was the greatest thing. It was kind of cool because when it slants back like that, you can see the needle and the where the stitch is being formed a little bit easier. So it is sort of a nice design, but um, later they didn't have the slant machines until the um, 50s, I think. Yeah. Okay, Chris has one more question, and um, this is our last one. So fabric, when unguided by a seam guider hand, tends to want to move slightly, but noticeably counterclockwise, is that normal? Okay. What adjustable factors might contribute to this. Yeah. So uh, Chris is again asking about the uh, fabric wanting to move. If you don't have a thread, uh, if you don't have a quarter inch foot or a seam guide on there the, to butt the uh, the edge of the fabric up against, the fabric wants to move around. Uh, usually that has to do with uh, presser foot pressure uh, uh, or presser foot height. Uh, but it can also uh, the first thing I always do is throw a different foot on there mm -hmm. because sometimes uh, the, the foot gets uh, bent a little bit. And so now the foot's not sitting evenly on the feed dogs. So one feed dog is, is pulling and the other one is not gripping as much and therefore it causes the fabric to fabric to turn. It should feed straight, but again, we've got, uh, we've got those videos coming out in the next couple weeks that will 
address that because that's the purpose of those videos is to uh, help you to do those adjustments mm. at home on your own uh, without needing to take to take your machine in. Uh, I think we're out of questions, but one of the things I wanted to mention, uh, actually Burl wanted me to mention because he's gotten quite a few phone calls and it always uh, pains us to see a machine um, get damaged. But that is everybody is uh, social distancing, being really hygiene um, conscientious. And so we've had several uh, people that have wiped their machine down with like Clorox wipes. And I can understand if you're, you're switching, you know, who's using the machine or whatever. Um, however, Clorox wipes, number one ingredient is uh, alcohol. And alcohol basically dissolves the clear coat on your machine. And um, very little, um, yeah, very little you can do about that when it happens. So you don't want to use anything alcohol-based on that. Uh, I would use a Norwex rag or something if you were actually worried about uh, something sanitary wise on your machine, but don't use don't use alcohol. So yeah. Okay. Well, very good. What time is it, Terry? It's been an hour. It's been an hour. Perfect. Thanks for watching. Yeah. So thanks for watching, and um, we will be uh, back. We're going to try to do this two times uh, a month on on Thursdays. So uh, you, can, you can email uh, questions in for future uh, fireside chats and such, and um, and then we'll we'll try to try to answer those as we can but um, yeah we'll uh, we'll see you we'll see you next time so thanks for watching and you guys have a great day